Hi everyone. In the last video we learned about the Boerne force. The force that a fluid exerts on any body placed inside it. And this force is directed towards the surface of the fluid. Now all this is good. But if you think about it, this isn't the only force acting on the body. Because if you have any object placed anywhere on the earth's surface, it's going to be attracted downwards because of the gravitational force. So this object too would be attracted downwards. Now, the buoyant force and the gravitational force seem to be in opposite directions, and they are. So, which way the object is going to move depends on which of these is stronger. Say for example, if the gravitational force is stronger than the buoyant force, then the net resultant force on this body is going to point downwards. This means that the object is going to move downwards. And we know for a fluid if an object is going down, that means it's sinking. However, if the buoyant force is stronger than the gravitational force, then the net resultant force is going to be upwards, which means the object is going to rise up. This is exactly what was happening in the helium balloon example which we did before. Now just knowing the balance of the gravitational and the buoyant force is not enough. We need a proper relation that allows us to predict beforehand if an object is going to float or sink. So let's look at the forces acting on this body. Like I said, you have the buoyant force, which we know is given by the formula of V into rho L into G, where rho L is the density of the liquid and V is the volume of this object. And the gravitational force is given by m into g, where m is the mass of this object. Now, we can simplify this mg and spread it out to have it in terms of the volume and density of the object. We would get the gravitational force is equal to v into rho s into g, where rho s is the density of this object. Now, if the body were to sink, then we know that the gravitational force should be stronger than the buoyant force which means v into rho s into g should be greater than v into rho l into g. You can cancel out the common volumes and the acceleration due to gravity from here and you would be left with the condition that rho s should be greater than rho l. It means that this object would sink if its density is greater than the density of the surrounding fluid. In much the same way, if you want the object to rise up, you want the upward buoyant force to be greater than the downward gravitational force, which means V into rho S into G should be less than V into rho L into G. Once again, we can cancel out the common volumes and the acceleration due to gravity and you would get rho S should be less than rho L for the object to actually rise up. So we now have both conditions for sinking as well as for rising up. An important point to note here is that whenever I'm referring to the density of the object, it doesn't necessarily mean the density of the material that it's made out of. Because we are only looking for the average density. And the average density may be different from the density of the material that the object is made up of. Let's take steel for example. Steel is much more denser than water. And hence, if you place a steel cube such as over here, it's going to sink because the density condition for sinking is matched. However, if I take the same amount of steel over there and spread it out into a hollow shell, then the effective density of this object is pretty low. That's because the mass is still the same as the small cube. However, the mass has been spread out over a larger volume. And from the fluid's perspective, it doesn't know that the inside is hollow. It just sees the mass of the object and the volume of water that it has displaced. In this case, the effective or the average density of the object is lower than the density of the surrounding fluid. And hence, once again, we meet the condition for rising up and this object is going to rise up. This is the very reason that metal ships can float on water. It's because even though the ship is made out of metal, it's created in a hollow shape which means it occupies a much larger volume. And from the water's perspective, it thinks that the entire material is that volume 
and hence exerts a buoyant force stronger than the gravitational force. However, if the hull is breached and water is allowed to enter the ship, then the effective volume of this ship essentially becomes just the thickness of its walls. And that would mean the density would rise up to be the density of the metal. In that case, the ship would sink. A submarine is a very good example of how we can use variable densities to moderate the buoyancy. A submarine has multiple reservoir tanks inside it. And these tanks can hold or release water. So when the submarine wants to sink, it allows the water to flow into its reservoir tanks. This reduces the effective volume of the submarine and hence raises its effective density. So the submarine eventually sinks down. Now when the same submarine has to rise up to the surface, it uses pumps to pump this water out of its reservoir tanks. This again increases the effective volume of the submarine and reduces its density. So the submarine can now rise back up. So we know about when an object is going to sink and when it is going to rise up. But there's a question over here. How far do they sink or rise up? The sinking part can be easily understood that it's going to sink till it hits the bottom. But the rising part is still a bit fuzzy. Because when it rises up, a number of things can come up. It may stop just before it reaches the surface or it may be thrown right out of the surface. So we need to study this rising up effect in detail to see its limit. Now to understand this, think about why this object is rising. Its buoyant force is stronger than the gravitational force. And as it rises up and breaks through the top surface, you will see that the volume that it now displaces in the liquid is changing. And with the changing volume of the displaced liquid, the buoyant force is also getting reduced. So on one side, you have the gravitational force that is constant and cannot change. But on the other side, the buoyant force which was originally stronger is gradually becoming lesser and lesser as the body rises up. And there will come a point where the buoyant force becomes equal to the gravitational force. And that is the point of the stable equilibrium. Because when the two forces are equal, the body would neither rise nor would it sink. It would just stay suspended like that, part of its volume under the surface of the fluid. At the equilibrium, different objects may have different percentages of their volume inside the level of the fluid. And we need to find a relation that allows us to find this percentage. So let's look at what's actually happening over here. You have the gravitational force and the buoyant force being equal to each other. And the gravitational force is given by V into rho S into G, where V is the total volume of the object, rho S is the density of the solid, and G is the acceleration due to gravity. But the buoyant force over here is no longer V into rho L into G, because the volume of the liquid that's been displaced is just the volume over here, which we call as V dash. So the buoyant force is given by V dash into rho L into G. At equilibrium, since these forces are equal, we can equate them and cancel out the G's. But we can't cancel out the volumes like in the earlier case. And if you reshuffle the terms around, you would get V dash by V is equal to rho S divided by rho L. This is the relation for the fraction of the volume that would be inside the fluid. And from here, finding the percentage is a trivial matter because all we need to do is multiply this quantity with 100. So now we know how much of the volume is going to stay under a liquid. And that depends not just on the density of the object, but also on the density of the fluid on which it is floating. All objects that float on a fluid will have a portion of their volumes inside that fluid. And that comes about from our relation that we just derived. And if you look at it, then you can tell that if the density of the object is almost the same as the density of the liquid, then it will have most of its volume inside the fluid. Take for example, ice cubes floating on water. However, 
if the density of the object is much less as compared to the density of the fluid, then the object will have a very small fraction of its volume under that liquid or fluid. The good example of this would be balloons floating on water. So that concludes our discussion for today. And we have learned about when an object rises up and when it sinks down. We've also learned about how the object is going to float on the surface of the fluid. But the way we arrived at those formulas is very important for you to understand. You need to know what are the forces involved and how they balance each other out. Because very often in competitives, you may be faced with questions where you have slightly more complicated scenarios with multiple fluids involved. And if you know exactly what are the forces there and how they act, then finding the answer to these questions wouldn't be a big deal for you. However, we will be doing one such question when we discuss our competitive problems in the next videos. And I'll see you again in those ones. Before I conclude, let's do our recap. The condition for sinking of any object in a fluid is given by rho s is greater than rho l. Well, rho s is the effective density of the object and rho l is the density of the surrounding fluid. The condition for the object rising up in a fluid is given by rho s is less than rho l, where rho s is the effective density of the object and rho l is the density of the surrounding fluid. If an object rises up in a fluid, it will rise to the surface and achieve equilibrium with a portion of its volume submerged in the fluid. The formula to find the fraction of the volume submerged in the fluid is given by V dash by V is equal to rho s by rho l.